it in the name of God! Ever wondered what warriors wore into the most epic battles in history? Get ready to be amazed as we uncover the top 10 insane armors in war history. Number 10. Polish Winged Hussar Armor Imagine yourself in Eastern Europe during the 16th to 18th centuries, a time when the Polish Winged Hussars were riding into battle. These Hussars were the shock cavalry of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and they were nothing short of elite. But what made their armor so unique? Well, these Hussars had a flair for the dramatic. Their armor was not just functional, it was a work of art. Picture heavily armored cavalrymen with stylized avatars charging into battle. This transformation was partly due to the reforms of Stephen Bathory, one of Poland's most successful kings. Now, let's talk about those iconic wings. The winged in winged hussar armor certainly draws attention. Historically, these hussars may have borrowed the idea from their Hungarian counterparts. But as time passed, their armor evolved into something even more stylish. In the 17th century, the inspiration for these wings shifted from the west to the east. The ornate cuirasses, helmets, mail sleeves, lances, concerts, swords, and even firearms added to the overall grandeur of their appearance. But what about those wings? Were they just for show, or did they serve a purpose on the battlefield? That's where history and legend collide. Archaeologists have discovered early wing types made by attaching rows of feathers to a straight batten. During the reign of John Sobieski, these wings became more elegant, possibly adorned with vibrant feathers from geese, eagles, and vultures. Now here's the mystery. The true purpose of these ornamental wings. While popular culture suggests that the feathers whistled their way into battle to terrify foes, most scholars believe they were primarily used to intimidate opponents through sheer visual impact. Imagine the dazzling effect of the Hussar warrior armor, enhanced by those magnificent wings. Number 9. Mongol Keshek Armor Back in the 13th and 14th centuries, the Mongol Keshek served as the chosen bodyguard for the royal families of the mighty Mongol horde. This prestigious position was established during the time of Genghis Khan and continued with his successors. But what set their armor apart? The core of Mongol Keshek armor remained quite consistent, with its foundation in the lamellar arrangement of small metal pieces. According to Carpini's descriptions, a European visitor to the court of the Great Khan, many of the Mongol heavy cavalrymen donned armor crafted from tiny metal pieces, expertly bound together by leather thongs. This armor style reflects the Asiatic composite type with lamellar overlays. But here's where it gets really interesting. The details. Not only did the warriors wear this intricately assembled armor, they also sported helmets made of larger metal pieces, complete with additional protective features like a neck guard crafted from iron plates. And let's not forget about the horses. Mongol Keshek even had a separate lamellar armor for their trusty steeds, despite them being of a smaller breed compared to Arabian and European horses. Now here's a topic of some debate. Silk shirts. Yes, silk. It's not unlikely that the elite cavalry forces of the Mongols wore silk shirts beneath their armor. But this wasn't about vanity. It had a practical purpose. Contrary to what you might think, most harm from penetrating arrows occurred when the arrowhead was pulled out of the skin. Silk came in handy here because its fibers could twist around the arrowhead, protecting the wound from the penetrative foreign object. Furthermore, Mongols might have been onto something even more profound. Silk's antibacterial properties when treated with dyes or even turmeric. Of course, they weren't germ theory experts, but their extensive experience in warfare and wound treatment likely taught them the benefits of this incredible material. Number 8. Sikulu Norman Knight Armor it's the 12th century, and the first bands of Norman mercenaries are infiltrating the southern parts of Italy, which were still under Eastern Roman rule. By 1017 AD, they're making their presence known. 
but it's not until the arrival of the renowned Norman adventurer Robert Guiscard, leading just five mounted riders and 30 followers on foot, according to the Byzantine historian Anna Komenina, that the real military conquests began in 1041 AD. Over the next 30 years, many towns in southern Italy fell to Norman forces, effectively putting an end to Eastern Roman influence. This period also coincides with the Norman conquest of the rich island of Sicily. This is a significant moment in European history because Sicily, with its dominant Christian population, had been under Arab rule for more than 150 years. The formation of the Kingdom of Sicily leads to a unique cultural blend rarely seen in Western Europe. The adaptable Norman rulers are heavily influenced by the previous Arabian cultural sphere. They adopt segments of Islamic traditions, styles, and even elements of dress, language, and literature. Now let's talk about the armor of the late Sikulu Norman knight, a product of these cultural overlaps. We can get a glimpse of this incredible armor from the carved capital depictions at the cloister of Montreal Cathedral. Imagine a magnificently equipped Norman nobleman, a knight wearing a partially gilded helmet with a face mask. This is complemented by a male coif and ritzy attire, reflecting the opulence of the era. But here's a fascinating detail. The knight's male chassis, their leggings, probably had their feet enclosed in iron scales. Number 7. Eastern Roman Cataphract Armor First things first, what's a cataphract? Well, the term is derived from the Greek kataphraktos, which means completely enclosed or armored. These were the big guns of the battlefield, known for their incredible armor. The cataphract concept originally came from ancient Iranian tribes and was adopted by Eastern Romans. They got the idea from their Eastern neighbors, the Parthians and later the Sassanid Persians. Here's the kicker. The first cataphracts in the Roman Empire were probably raised from mounted Sarmatian auxiliaries which shows how the Romans were quick to embrace this powerful cavalry style. The Eastern Roman cataphract was all about super heavy armor and weapons, including maces and sometimes bows. These were the knights of the Byzantine Empire, if you will. Their armor featured something called a kilbanion. This was a Byzantine lamellar cuirass made of metal bits sewn onto leather or cloth pieces. But that's not all. They didn't stop at just one layer. They often wore this clibanian over a male corselet, creating a heavy composite armor that was basically a tank on a horse. But wait, there's more. Under or over the corselet, they wore padded armor for extra protection. These warriors were like walking fortresses. They also had fembraces, greaves, leather gauntlets, and even male hoods attached to their helmets. The Eastern Roman cataphracts were a force to be reckoned with, and their armor reflected their invincibility on the battlefield. It's no wonder they maintained their elite status from antiquity right through the early Middle Ages, carrying on the tradition of Eastern equestrianism. Number 6. Aztec Jaguar Warrior Armor Let's explore the world of the Aztec Jaguar Warriors, those legendary elite soldiers of the Aztec Empire who earned their place in history and even in the Age of Empires game. It's the 14th to 16th century AD, yet the Aztecs are on the rise. The Jaguar warriors are the cream of the crop in their military ranks. They're chosen based on their sheer bravery and their knack for capturing enemy warriors, who were often destined for some ritual sacrifice. These warriors were at the forefront of the Aztec war machine. But here's what makes them stand out. They weren't just nobility. Unlike many societies of their time, the Aztec elite military force included both nobles and commoners. This speaks volumes about the Aztec society, where training, ferocity, and bravery were valued more than your social class. However, it's worth noting that most Jaguar warriors expected to be rewarded with lands and titles by their lords, somewhat mirroring the medieval European knightly class. Now let's talk about the armor. These battle-hardened warriors knew how to dress for success, and it matched their fearsome reputation. Jaguar warriors adorned themselves with pelts of jaguars and pumas. 
Not only did this make them look incredibly imposing, but it also had a ritualistic aspect. The warriors believed they could absorb the strength of these fierce predator animals. But they didn't stop at animal pelts. It's quite likely that these elite warriors also wore a type of quilted cotton armor known as Ichka Huipilai under those pelts. The higher ranking members took it up a notch with additional apparel, including colored feathers and plumes. You can imagine the visual spectacle they created on the battlefield. But these warriors weren't just about looking good, they were deadly. They wielded a weapon called the Makwahito, which roughly translates to Hungry Wood. It was a wooden sword with sharp obsidian blades drilled into its sides. Imagine being on the receiving end of that. Number 5. Mycenaean Dendra Panopoli Okay, let's take a journey back in time, way back to the 15th century BC. We're in the Bronze Age, and we're talking about the Mycenaean Dendra Panopoli. No, it's not the stuff of imagination. This incredible armor is the real deal. So the story goes like this. The Dendra Panopoli gets its name from the village of Dendra in the Argolid, where the earliest of these amazing specimens were discovered. And oh boy, this armor was something else. It was probably used by the elite members of the Mycenaean army, the ones who rode into battle in chariots. Now let's talk about what makes this armor so special. It's like a jigsaw puzzle made of bronze. Picture this. 15 separate sheets of beaten bronze, all held together by leather bands. But wait, there's more. The main cuirass, the chest plate, is a work of art on its own. It's divided into two parts, one for the front and one for the rear, and they're connected by a hinge. Imagine putting that on. But the awesomeness doesn't stop there. The Dendra Panopoli also had massive shoulder guards, triangular armpit guards, to keep those vital areas safe, and a high bronze collar that formed a deep neck guard. And let's not forget the greaves, those leg protectors that were padded with linen. When you put all of those pieces together, you get a complete, fully covered plated body armor. It must have been incredibly imposing on the battlefield. But here's the catch. It was likely pretty darn difficult to wear. You can't have it all, right? Number 4. Samurai O Yoroi Our next adventure takes us to the lands of the legendary samurai and their O Yoroi, which literally translates to great armor. This armor was not for your everyday samurai. It was reserved for the elite high-ranking warriors, or Bushi. The O Yoroi was like a work of art, and its most distinctive feature was its unique cross-section, shaped like the letter C. It consisted of three sections that provided full protection for the back, left, and front of the body. But here's the interesting part. The right side, where the sea was open, had a separate section called the Wadate. Wadate. This Wadate was the first piece to go on, and it was tied to the body with two silk cords, one around the waist and the other diagonally across the chest and over the left shoulder. The straps, called watagami, were reinforced with vertical, semi-rounded plates to protect the shoulders from those nasty vertical cutting strokes. The cuirass was closed with traditional buttons known as kohaze, and they weren't your run-of-the-mill buttons. They were made from hardwood, horn, and sometimes even ivory. Talk about attention to detail. But what makes the O Yoroi stand out even more is its leather finish, known as the Ikawa. There's an element called surubashiri that gave the illusion of full plate armor. It's all about style, right? And let's not forget the mengu, the facial armor. This piece was crafted from either iron or lacquered leather. Number 3. Greenwich Plate Armor If you think you've seen some fancy armor, wait till you hear about this one. So Greenwich Plate Armor got its name from the Royal Armory at Greenwich in London. It's like the fashion capital of armor, established by none other than King Henry VIII in 1511. This place was where the magic happened when it came to English armor production. They were making armor with some serious style, let me tell you. King Henry VIII was all about having the best of the best, so he brought in German, 
or as they call them, all main armorers to craft his one-of-a-kind plate suits. We've even got the All Main Armorers album, which is like a designer catalog of armor from 1557 to 1587. It's got 29 illustrated designs that would make any knight's heart skip a beat. But what's really cool about Greenwich armor is that it was all about customization. These suits had interchangeable pieces for different situations. Need to go jousting? No problem. Heading into infantry battle? Got you covered. They even had sets for light cavalry. It was like the Swiss army knife of armor. But all of this style and functionality didn't come cheap. A nobleman looking to snag one of these bad boys could end up forking over upwards of 500 pounds. That's a small fortune back in the day. Now let's talk about the bling factor. Henry VIII wasn't one to hold back on the ornate design. Armorers went all out with gilding, etching, bluing, and inlay. They even brought in famous artists like Hans Holbein to design decorative elements. This armor wasn't just for protection, it was a work of art. One of the stars of the show was Henry VIII's foot combat armor. This thing was next level. It had turning joints that fit together perfectly, making it super flexible. The joints and buttocks were fully articulated for maximum maneuverability. This armor was like the Iron Man suit of its time, completely impenetrable and fit for a king. But as time rolled on and Queen Elizabeth I took the throne, the armor game changed. Her father's over-the-top designs gave way to simpler styles that mimicked everyday clothing. Number 2. Gothic Plate Armor We're talking about armor that's not just as tough as nails, but also looks pretty darn stylish. Gothic plate armor is right up there with the best of the best in the history of armor. It's like the perfect combination of fashion and function. This style was born in the Holy Roman Empire, with the early versions coming to life between 1420 and 1450. If you thought the Goths were all about dark and broody, think again, because this armor is all about full protection and flexibility. Now, the cities of Augsburg and Nuremberg were the places to be if you wanted to get your hands on some Gothic armor. Just like Milanese armor, Gothic designers liked to travel and share their knowledge. It's like they had an armor exchange program going on. But here's the fun part. Gothic-style armor borrowed a lot from the Milanese armor. Hey, when you've got good ideas, you share them, right? These two regions were like next-door neighbors, so it's no wonder they influenced each other. Now, fast forward to the early 1500s and you've got some seriously cool regional styles of plate armor taking shape. One standout is the white armor. No, it's not armor painted white, it's just a catchy name. But what's even cooler is Maximilian armor, named after the big shot himself, Emperor Maximilian I. This Maximilian armor, crafted between 1515 and 1525, is basically the holy grail of armor. It's like the ultimate blend of metal and fashion. The rounded curves and fluting designs aren't just for show. They boost protection and let the wearer move like a ninja. Seriously, a soldier's ability to move quickly and effectively is key, and this armor nailed it. Number 1. Milanese Plate Armor Milan, Italy, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. This place was like the Silicon Valley of armor production. Seriously, they had world-class craftsmen who were like Elon Musk's of their day. But instead of electric cars, they were making some of the toughest armor in history. Milanese plate armor hit its peak during the 1400s and early 1500s. This stuff was so strong because it was all about that perfect fit. Soldiers wearing Milanese plate armor got suits that were tailor-made to their measurements. It's like having a custom tailored suit, but way more hardcore. The Milanese armorers were all about simplicity and form. None of that fancy, overly complex stuff. They knew how to protect a soldier while making them look sleek. Italian armor was all about those smooth, rounded shapes that not only looked cool, but fully covered and protected a warrior. As we got into the Renaissance period, Milanese plate armor started to get a bit fancier but it never sacrificed function for form. 
You see, armorers from the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically modern-day Germany and even Britain, couldn't resist copying the Milanese styles. Can you blame them? This stuff was top-notch. But here's the kicker. Italian armorers didn't just sit around in Milan. No, they packed their bags and took their knowledge on the road. They emigrated to other countries, worked in royal armories, and shared their Milanese armor secrets with other craftsmen. Thank you for joining us on this epic journey through history. If you're as amazed by these incredible armors as we are, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more intriguing historical content. Share your thoughts in the comments. And remember, history is full of fascinating stories waiting to be explored.